Here we go. As you take a look at the first slide, uh, there's looks like there's old and there's new, but there's one thing that's the same. And uh, I think you spot it pretty quickly. The one thing that is the same is the steam. So for the past thousand years, uh, for the most part, the way we've gotten energy from our environment is by burning stuff. And that's it. That's pretty much the only way we've been harvesting energy. You know, maybe a little bit of hydropower or wind power with um, uh, windmills and water wheels and things like that. But for the most part, we've been burning stuff for a long time. In my generation, the boomers, we got really good at burning stuff. Burn, 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 burn. And obviously we're seeing the problem with that. So we've been exhausting heat. Um, and not only that, but greenhouse gas emissions uh, into the atmosphere for a long time. And we've been doing it faster and faster and faster. This is going to be a little bit of a downer, but uh, but there is good news ahead. So, um, as we talked about before, when we start talking about solar panel and renewables, it, it, it's possible we, we could definitely fix things. But uh, anyway, it is remarkable to, to me when we take a look at the difference between the two. How um, there's been a lot more technology, but some things fundamentally really haven't changed. So tonight we're going to take a look at the first law of thermodynamics. And we're going to take a look at um, what are called PV diagrams. And uh, we're pretty much going to focus in on those first two bullets. And then when I have a meeting on uh, Thursday, we're, we're going to take a look at the heat engine part of it at then. So let's start off with the first law. It looks kind of... Um, uh, innocent <laughs> hanging out there, but don't underestimate it. It's complicated. And one of the reasons why it's complicated is because there are three variables there. And if, if all three are changing at the same time, that can make understanding it quite challenging. So let's just talk about the, the pieces. First of all, the delta U used for internal energy. And we can tell what's happening with the internal energy if it's going up or going down because internal energy is based on the average kinetic energy of the molecules that are uh, in that particular sample. So average kinetic energy is directly dependent on temperature. So the way we can tell if the internal energy of a sample of gas is changing is that we can just look and see if the temperature is changing. And if the temperature, if temperature is not changing, then the change in internal energy is zero. Now Q, we've already talked about that. That was the star of chapter 14 and about heat. So if you add heat, the temperature is going to go up and that's why the internal energy is going to go up. So just from a fundamental basis, this, um, if we're thinking about heating up a liquid or a solid, then delta U is really that MC delta T thing that we were working with last week. And then W is for work. This is a physics one concept. So work is how energy enters or leaves the system. And in this case, if we're talking about, let's suppose that we have um, uh, hot gases inside our internal combustion engines. And when they do work, when they expand and they, they give our car uh, mechanical energy, that energy is no longer available to the system. So that's how come there's a minus sign there. So we're talking about a closed system and we can monitor internal energy by checking its temperature. We could have heat flow in or flow out. So heat flowing in is positive. That means it's going to have a role in increasing internal energy. But if the gas itself is doing work on the rest of the universe, then that energy is no longer available. And that's how come the minus sign is here. So this is really just conservation of energy. Now, if you're jotting down notes for yourself, um, there are some special cases of the first law 
they make it a little bit easier to work with. And so you might, uh, you know, I don't know if you were like a note card person or you like just jotting down notes or things like that. But uh, there are going to be times where I'm going to probably say things a couple of times. <laughs> and that, that means that you probably want to um, make note of that or think really carefully about it. So we start with PV diagrams. Sounds like chemistry. So the ideal gas law certainly applies. And the reason why we keep track of uh, PV diagrams is because our main goal in understanding it is that the first law is based on energy. And PV diagrams do tell us about energy. And in fact, if we take a look at the units, if we multiply pressure in SI units, newtons per meter squared times volume in cubic meters, we get newtons times meters, which you'll remember from physics one is a joule. So really, a PV diagram represents energy, if you will, an energy state. So each location, and to think about the ideal gas, and um, I think I'm actually going to, yeah, I'm gonna hop on the whiteboard here really quick uh, and just uh, talk about this in a little more detail. So uh, bear with me, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna change camera views. There we go. Great. So I just want to do a little bit more detail with you here about what constitutes an energy state. So pressure. And the SI units squared are newtons per meter squared. And then volume down here, where SI units are meters cubed. <clears throat> so in your chemistry class, you might have done something a little bit different as far as units go. But the reason why we like it is that if I break out and I consider a small chunk, a little bit of area right here. So this area, A, She's in a little bit. <clears throat> this, if I thought, was trying to find the area, obviously I would do base times height. So area equals base times height. But like we said, the base is going to have this is going to have units of cubic meters. Uh, and then we're multiplying by newtons per meter squared. And you can see there's some cancellation of units. That cancels two powers of meters. And that's equal to a joule. So area is actually equal to work. So let's imagine a, a point right here. So for an ideal gas, PV equals N R T, right? So number of moles, right, per constant, and temperature in degrees Kelvin. So if temperature is some constant, then these two are going to be inversely related to each other. The product of pressure and volume, that means the location of this dot here on this graph not only represents a given pressure and volume, but it also represents temperature. So a point on this represents a temperature. But if each point corresponds to a temperature, then it also corresponds to a certain amount of energy. So each point corresponds to a temperature. Therefore, a 
a certain amount of internal energy. Now there might be two places on, there might be points on this graph that have the same energy. It's totally possible. And in fact, if it is an ideal gas and the temperature remains fixed, we know that pressure and volume are going to be inversely related to each other. And then all of these points along that graph are going to have the same energy state. So that's why the PV diagram is very useful. And we can actually track and um, see what happens with some special processes and see what happens to the change in energy. Because the big trick here is being able to allow heat to move from one place to another. And in the process, get useful work. So we know when we have uh, different temperatures that heat is going to flow between those two temperatures. Excuse me. But what if you could harvest some of that heat and then transform it into useful work? And that's what this is uh, really all about. So in the next few slides, we're going to talk about some specific thermodynamic processes. And it's going to get a little bit abstract. That's normal. But I have a treat for you because as we work our way through it, I'm going to turn this into a game. So, and the game is sort of like Sudoku. So I think once you, you get there, you're going to kind of like it. I know that's weird, right? If I'm telling you you're going to like it ahead of time, it's probably, oh, you're going to like this medicine. Mmm, tasty. All right, so uh, here we go. We'll start off, this is one of our, our processes that we're going to talk about quite a bit. An isothermal process. Right, so ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So in an isothermal process, the temperature doesn't change. What could that look like? If I added heat into this piston and the piston started expanding, but the temperature remained the same, that would be an isothermal process. So it's quite possible. And all the points on an isothermal curve, right? so in this case, um, volume would be inversely dependent on pressure and vice versa. So as the volume of a gas expands, then the pressure drops, even though the temperature stays the same. And that means that all of the points along this curve are going to have the same internal energy because it's the same temperature. We assume in the ideal gas law when we say PV equals NRT and N is the number of moles, that the N doesn't change. So the quantity of gas that we have doesn't change. So this is one of the um, processes that we're going to look at. Another one is called an adiabatic process. So that's how you say that word, adiabatic. I think you're supposed to be screen sharing. Yeah, I should be. I thought I was. It's OK. Darn it. That's all right. OK. Thank you for speaking up. And I didn't have the chat on here. OK. Uh, come on, Zoom. All right. Great. Can you just look at my face? I hope I look like really into it. Anyway, yes, here we go. Slides. Right, so isothermal, you can see that uh, these curves are inversely, they're inverse curves. And um, that means that for an isothermal process, there's no internal energy. Now, what that means, though, is that the other two variables in the first law are going to be directly dependent on each other. And we'll see that in just a second. Adiabatic <clears throat> kind of looks the same, so you can't really tell by looking at a PV diagram. You can't really tell these two apart because they both have that same inverse look to them. But adiabatic is a process where there's no heat flow. Uh, you might say, well, wait, how does temperature change when there's no heat flow? And, uh, and the answer actually is you, this happens all the time. So if you've 
used a, uh, a can of spray paint, for example, you notice that the can will get cold if you've been using it for a while. Now, nobody extracted the heat from that. That was just uh, the pressure um, and volume of the gas inside is expanding and it's causing a temperature drop. Snowmaking, that's exactly what that is. It's an adiabatic process. So uh, the water needs to be as close to freezing as possible. Actually, I think now that they are uh, able to add some kind of, um, uh, some kind of, uh, I, I forget if it's bacterial in nature, uh, but there are ways to actually uh, jet the water out a little bit below freezing. But then when um, the spray expands really quickly, there's a phase change and the water turns into snow. So yes, that's an adiabatic process. Then these two, so three and four, these are special processes where, um, where work is very easy to calculate. So isobaric means constant pressure. And we talked about how the area of a PV diagram corresponds to work done. So the area underneath this, if we were holding a constant pressure and then allowing a gas to expand, it would be doing work on the outside environment. Maybe it's pushing something, maybe it's um, turning a, a crankshaft or something like that. So that's an easy way to calculate work. And then over here, since the area under the curve is the work done, if the volume stays the same, it stays the same, then there is no work done at all. So if the pressure stays constant, this is for an isobaric process, then all we have to do is multiply the pressure times the change in volume. Calculating work for other processes is actually very difficult. So, uh, but this is the easiest way to do it. And of course, if the volume stays the same, then the work done is equal to zero. All right, so here's an example of a thermodynamic process that brings a gas back to its original place. So all of these can happen at the same time. An isothermal process where the temperature stays the same and that means the internal energy doesn't change. An isobaric one where the work done is pressure times change in volume. An isovolumetric where the work done is equal to zero. Now, in the process of going around a cycle like this, and typically what we'd have a, were arrows that would tell us which way we're going. So typically in a process like this, as we follow a gas through the different steps, by the time we wind up back at A, we, the, we know that A has a characteristic temperature. And since it has a characteristic temperature and we return to that temperature, that means the total change in internal energy is zero. So when you have a cycle, it's written like this, of different uh, processes that bring a gas back to its original energy state, then the total change in energy is zero. And we're going to do lots of examples of this, folks, so definitely going to help you out. Okay, so here's the game. This is the Sudoku game. And we're going to work with these charts. So this is kind of my invention as a way of helping people understand how heat engines work. So the table shows the special considerations that we have for each one of these processes. So Isothermal, temperature is constant. That means that delta T is zero, so delta U is zero. Remember, temperature is a macroscopic uh, manifestation of what's happening on the microscopic level. So if that's the case, and the first law is that delta U equals Q minus W, if delta U is zero, then those two are equal to each other. So if you can calculate one, then you know the other. So I'm telling you the rules for this Sudoku game. Isobaric. Well, that means that um, we know how to calculate work. Work is pressure times change in volume. So, and that's a relatively easy calculation to do. If the volume doesn't change, then that means the work is equal to zero. So any heat added is equal to a change in internal energy. This is actually really Q equals MC delta T. Because in that situation, you know, if, if we're, uh, dropping a hot piece of copper into water, and then, um, then the volume is not changing, and there's certainly no work being done. 
And finally, adiabatic means that the Q is equal to zero. So any change in internal energy is equal to the opposite of the work done by the gas. And that's key. I said work done by the gas. So we're going to do some examples that highlight what that means. Now, as you take a look, um, how this chart works is that we type in the work here and the Q value, and then the change in internal energy is the difference between the two. Sometimes as we read a problem, we're going to be given clues that help us fill in this chart a little bit. And then we can use the simple uh, mathematical relationship between the two to maybe find out what the others are. And that's what makes it sort of like Sudoku. So I'm going to stop with the notes and then I'm going to pick up our agenda and take a look at a couple of practice problems. The, um, these problems are really dense. The vocabulary is very dense. And so we're going to spend some time really carefully decoding these. And I hope that uh, one of the things that you're able to do is uh, to try and make note of how this works. Let's take a quick look. And this is supposed to be a level one problem, right? Yikes. OK, so gas in the cylinder, light frictionless piston, aisle 23 at lows and maintain the atmospheric pressure. Whoa, okay, so even that, you know, we wanna slow down and think about what that means. Maintained at atmospheric pressure. So that means this first statement is an isobaric process. 1400 kilocalories is added to the gas, then the volume is observed to increase slowly from 12 cubic meters to 18.2 cubic meters. Calculate the work done by the gas and the change in internal energy. Yeah, so like I said, it's very simple. I'm going to change screens and then uh, walk through this one on the whiteboard. So I'm going to stop the share. and go back to the whiteboard. Uh, so to, to correct that, um, there was a question about if, is there no internal energy if it's isothermal? And the answer is it stays the same. There's no change in internal energy. Thanks for the question. Okay. So here's our PV diagram. And the pressure is going to be held constant. We don't really know what that pressure is, though. So, question mark. But we do know what the change in volume is. Oh, actually, sorry. It says atmospheric pressure. So, uh, 1 atm. And then our change in volume is from 12 to 18.2. And so the work done is this area under the curve. So the work done is equal to pressure times change in volume. So here's our first uh, little clue. This is really important. So it says that uh, the gas is allowed to expand. So the arrow for this 
process points to the right. So if the arrow points to the right, that means that delta V is greater than zero. So the work done by the gas is greater than zero. And that means in expanding, that energy that went into causing it to expand is no longer accessible to our system. And that's how come it's subtracted. So here's what we have for our first law. Just want to double check and make sure that's on the screen. So delta U equals Q minus W. Now we have a problem with units here. So these are okay. These are in cubic meters, but ATM, it's not good. We're also given that Q uh, is equal to 1,400 kilocalories. That's not great either. Because we know we see SI units down here, and that's where we want to live. So 1,400 kcals. So we should do a unit conversion. So one calorie is uh, the amount of heat required to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And in joules, that's 4.186. So kcal is gonna be equal to 4,186 joules per kcal. So we just go ahead and do that conversion right now. And be done with it. And obviously this is a really big number. Excuse me while I grab my calculator. And I'm going to shift uh, to scientific notation here just so we can uh, manage that. Okay, so I have 5.86 times 10 to the sixth power. Joules. And that's where Q is right here. Now one atmosphere, if we're gonna write that in SI units, one atmosphere is equal to 1.013. times 10 to the fifth Newtons per square meter. Yeah, suddenly we have really big numbers, right? Because a, a joule is actually a very small unit of energy. And um, this number right here is actually the weight, one atmospheric pressure, it's actually the weight of all the air. If you imagine a column of air, you spread out a newspaper. Remember what those are? So if you spread out seven days, how about that? That's going to have an area a little bit less than square meter, but you know, you kind of get one. So if you imagine that you took a column of air that's sitting on top of seven days, then this is the weight of the air on that newspaper. So a square meter is quite, quite a bit. All right, so we're in good shape right now. We can go ahead and calculate what this looks like then. So there's the pressure I'm going to use. And then the change in volume is from uh, 12 up to 18.2. So when you do changes, we always do final mass initial. So 18.2 minus 12 is going to be 6.2. And like we said, because of the direction they are, that's a number that's greater than one. So we can go ahead and put in our numbers here. So 1.013 times 10 to the fifth. And then 6.2. I'll leave the units off because uh, just make it a little bit simpler. Now I wrote this uh, to the 10 to the sixth power. So I'm gonna write this to 10 to the sixth power as well because it's gonna make our math a little bit easier. And so this is uh, 0 0.63 times 10 to the six joules. So that's how much work is done in this process. Just checking the chats to see if anybody had any questions.
All right, what the heck did they ask us uh, for anyway? And um, we calculate the work done and the change in internal energy of the gas. Sir, is this supposed to be 10 to the six or 10 to the fifth? Uh, I put the decimal point in the wrong place. No, this. No. This is 10 to the sixth. This is also 10 to the sixth power. Oh, got okay. it. Right there. I'll make the decimal points a little bit darker. And the reason for me doing that is now to add those is going to be a little bit easier. That's all. But thanks for jumping in and clarifying. They asked us uh, actually to find this, but we had to do all this intermediate work in order to get here. So now uh, delta U is going to be equal to, now I can just add these up. So the Q. It's big, 5.86 times 10 to the sixth. Make that decimal a little bit darker. And then subtract because this energy is no longer available to our system, the 0.63. And that explains my rounding also. Right, so then the new answer is going to be 5. Two three times ten to the sixth. This is going to be the name of the game for uh, our work with this material. Is that frequently you're going to be asked for questions, but you don't have any clues. So you actually have to calculate the other numbers first before you can find the one that you were actually asked about. So just checking in. Um, I'm going to keep on going. We're going to do a few more of these. So if you want to take a screenshot or just take a picture with your phone, feel free to. If you're checking the time, I'm probably going to go to about 7.30 before we take a break. Okay. Good. Uh, no breaks. If you have any friends that are taking Physics 2 at UVM this semester, this chapter kills. But we're going to be okay because we're just going to play Sudoku. It's all going to be fine. All right, let's check out number four. And again, it, you know, it's just everything is so densely worded, it takes a little bit. Uh, the calculus space class, you should see <clears throat> this is when people switch from engineering majors to business. You know, it's like clockwork. <laughs> right? So I noticed that this is uh, pretty densely, well, let's read it first. So you've got <clears throat> two liters of an ideal gas and atmospheric pressure cooled at constant pressure to a volume of one, and then expanded isothermally back to two, whereupon, <laughs> what? Whereupon? The pressure is increased at constant volume until the original pressure is good. When's the last time we heard whereupon used in a sentence? All right, so let's take this individually. I mean, I do like this question because you really have to pull it apart. And it's a good one for us to talk about. So it's a sketch of PV diagram. Let's do each step individually, right? So first of all, it says two liters of ideal gas at atmospheric pressure are cooled at constant pressure. So I mean, the pressure doesn't change and cooled to one liter. So that process is gonna look like this. It's gonna be a flat line to represent. So I'll just throw in a little PV diagram here. And the arrow's gonna go this way because the volume gets smaller. And I might as well bring in the units. This is two down to one, so it's not to scale, but. And the pressure is um, it's one atmosphere. Okay, so that's one. Let's do another. So we're going to do three all together. <laughs> it's 
this is a square pond down here. Okay. <clears throat> so the next one says, uh, expand it isothermally back to two liters. Okay, so an isothermal process looks like this. And we went back to two liters. So this is two again. Yeah, from what? And isothermal means, so it's allowed to expand backward. Isothermal means the temperature doesn't change. So volume is in, pressure is inversely dependent on volume. So this graph uh, has a curve that's like an over X. Okay, good. Whereupon <laughs> the pressure has increased at constant volume. Okay, so the volume here is two. So we're still at two here. And then the pressure's increased until the original pressure is reached. So we're here, and we don't know what the final pressure of this was, but we know it's going to increase at constant volume. So the volume doesn't change. That means it's a vertical line, and the arrow's shaped like that. So now we can put the whole thing together and see what that looks like. So this is pressure and volume. And the reason why I broke it out into three separate steps is because it's hard to know where to start on this thing if you're going to do all three. So our first one goes like that. And our second step goes like this. And our third step goes like this. And now we have a complete cycle. So like I said, I wouldn't have known to start over here uh, if I was just trying to do everything at the same time. So here's a couple of important things to remember. In this case, uh, this has a delta V that's negative. So the work done here is going to be negative. Here, this is isothermal. So delta U equals zero. And that means whether, whatever heat is added is equal to the work done. And in this case, this is isobarometric, uh, so the work done is equal to zero. And by simplification of the first law, then that means that whatever change in energy is simply caused by heat being added. Okay, I know it's pretty abstract, but we're just trying to learn the rules of the, of the road here, so to speak. So we'll do two more and we'll, nah, two more? Yeah, yeah, let's do two more and we'll take a break and we'll come back and try 12. And then we'll talk about what we're gonna do about that quiz. So six, yeah, we just did six, so 10. <clears throat> Oh, this is delicious. So good. All right. So let's go ahead and I'm, I'm going to duplicate this PV diagram. You have it right in front of you, but this is where it really does start to look like Sudoku. So uh, 1.4 and 2.2 ATMs. So this is pressure in ATMs. And the volumes are in liters. So 0.8 and 9.3, or 6.8 rather, sorry. All right, so now let's be really careful. Let's think about what this looks like. So this is labeled point A, and this is labeled point B, and this is labeled point C. So each point on the pressure volume diagram is going to correspond to a particular temperature. 
So that's an important thing to think about. Some of these may be the same temperature, but in general, we want to think about each one of these as being a unique energy state. And so things are going to change. These dynamic variables in between the two. Once again, first law, I'm just going to write it nice and big up here. Q minus W. Uh, sorry, which question is this? Uh, this is 10. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Can you see? Is this showing up on your screen? Or do I have to move my camera a little bit? I don't know if this means moves the camera up or is it Oh, sorry. No, yeah, it's, it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah, I knew the symbols. And then now we wave when we end meeting. All right. So here we go. Let's get into it. Uh, the heat's allowed to flow out of an ideal gas at constant volume so that the pressure drops from 2.2 to 1.4 atms. So that means the error for this process is like this. And that's isovolumetric, so there's no work done for that. So that's from A to B. And then it expands at constant pressure, and pressure is 1.4 atms, uh, from 6.8 liters to 9.3. So the direction of my arrow is like that. And so I know for this that the work done is going to be equal to P times delta V. I have a little bit of an issue with that. So again, for this process, work done is equal to P times delta V. Uh, one of the issues is that this is an atmosphere, so we have to convert that to newtons per square meter. And this is in change in volume is uh, needs to be in cubic meters, but it's in liters right now. So we'll, we'll have to change that. And then this part, we remember that this is delta V equals zero. So that means the work done is zero for that. And these are all little clues we're trying to, these are the rules of the game, and we're just trying to fish out those rules as we decode this really dense wording. And then for the last step, is that the temperature reaches its original value. So this, the temperature at A is equal to the temperature at C. So that means the internal energy at A is equal to the internal energy at C. So that means through this entire process, the total amount of internal energy did not change. That's another clue. So some of the clues are stated explicitly and some are implied. And that, that does make it a little bit challenging. Okay, well, let's calculate some of the things that we need to get out of this, right? So one of the things that I, I need to do is, I know that uh, for DC, I need to calculate the work done. So the pressure is 1.4 atmospheres. I'll just do the conversion right here on the board. And you'll notice that um, I'm not really, I didn't go ahead and read about what we're asked for. We're just going to solve everything. And then we can go back and look and see if we've covered this thing. So 1.4 times 1.015 E5. And that gives me uh, 1.42 times 10 to the fifth. And the change of volume <clears throat> so if I subtract these two from each other, I get 2.5, but it's in liters. So then that's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus three. The cubic meter is actually a pretty big volume. Uh, so it takes a thousand liters to equal a cubic meter. And now I can just multiply those two together. So we'll see what we got. And 
I get 355 joules. Positive 355. And again, that's joules. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's uh, start building this chart. And the way it works, at least the way my chart works, is that I'm going to have a path, and then I'm going to have a place to write in Q, and a place to write in W, and then a place to write in delta U. And here's where the different paths are. So I have one path that's A to B. And then I have another path that's B to C. And then I have the total. So I'm going to finish turning this into a chart. Then we can start adding things to see uh, what we know and what we don't know. So the first thing I know the work done for the path AB is equal to zero. And then I know the work done from B to C is equal to 355. And so that means the total work done is 355. That's all explicitly stated. Now, here's the thing that's implied. It says that this thing is allowed to expand and it comes back to its original temperature. So if we're trying to think about how this works, the volume didn't change while the pressure drops. So how does that happen? Well, you probably have to remove heat. But then in order to make this happen, you probably have to add heat in order to make that happen. And then we wind up back at the same temperature. So even though I don't know what happened here and here, I do know what happens here. Because the total for the process brings us back to the same temperature. So the total change in internal energy has to be zero. Right. Okay, and so if this is equal to zero and delta U is Q minus W, that tells us what Q is. Did you see how we didn't have any clue about what uh, any of the heats were, but because of the relationship between the three variables, we can sort of fish that out. I don't have numbers for any of the others, but I believe if you take a look at the question, it doesn't ask you about that. It says calculate the total work done by the gas in the process. That's this. And then <clears throat> calculate the change in internal energy of the process. That's this. And then calculate heat flow. That's that even though the actual question itself didn't say anything about view flow. All right. I know it's kind of abstract, but. Okay. Um, I'm just taking a look at the chats really quick and so I can respond to them. Thank you very much for putting those up. And uh, a question about the quiz. What's it going to be doing? I think doing a couple of days will probably be good. Um, and uh, I'm going to put it up. It is up on Canvas right now. And uh, but when we go on break, I'm going to really quickly move it over into a quiz format for a Canvas. At least I think I can do that. Okay, so let's take it's uh, 730 right now. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back at 740.
Okay, I'm done. Uh, let's go ahead if you can uh, select a tab that for Canvas. And I'll share screen. And I, I would just like you to check your canvas on your end to make sure that you can see it because I just published it. So if you click on quizzes, then you should have chapter 14 quiz. Uh, I am, I have to go back and edit these, so I, that's why I unpublished them really quick, but you should be able to open chapter 14 quiz. So I'm going to stop sharing, just get a little feedback from you. Uh, is there anybody who didn't see it? Just add to the chat. Anna? Yeah, I don't see it. Okay. I don't even see like a a link for quizzes. I have home announcements, syllabus, modules, grades, people, library resources, office, Zoom, but a couple others, but no quizzes. Okay. Yeah, same. Yeah, I don't see anything over on the left for it. I did see it pop up on the right side under my to-do list. That's the only place I can, I can see it. Okay, all right. I don't even have yeah. a to-do list. Anna, do you have a to-do list? I do not know. That's, that's um, cool. I found it under grades, but there's, oh. no, there's no quizzes section. Like if you go to grades, it'll say chapter 14 at the top, but that's not normally where it is, but it got me to it. Oh yeah, if you go to grades and then you click that, I guess then you can click um, take the quiz and that works. It's a little roundabout, but I guess that works. Okay. Kind of clunky. But, um, I'm just going to try one more thing here. Um, okay, I just made a change and if you don't mind, just kind of browsing around a little bit, see if it popped up anywhere else. Did the quiz thing show up or did it show up on a to-do list? I just went back and I assigned it to the section. Okay, Joe says it's available in the dashboard. Oh, so maybe, thank you. So maybe I have to change the setting. Something I can do after we, we're done. Right. Okay. All right, we're getting there. So there's a roundabout way of getting it. Click on grades and then activate it. I set them up as uh, just essay questions. So if you're trying to type, I'd like you to show as much work as you can, obviously. So you have some conceptual questions. That's just going to be straight text. Uh, you're not really under any restrictions. So, uh, I mean, obviously it would be great if you didn't like copy and paste from the internet. That would be bad. And uh, uh, but, you know, there really aren't any restrictions. It's just demonstrating what you know. That would be great. And then for the problems, just trying to show as much work as you can. So you can do, you know, shortcuts like use caret instead of um, raise to a power. And uh, if you're typing in numbers, uh, it's totally legit if you're, you know, to write in a number that looks like this. Um, so let me just read the chat really quick. 
Like that number, if you can see that in the chat. 3.15 E7, so that would be 3.15 times 10 to the seventh power, which is approximately the number of seconds in a year. So just little shortcuts like that. And you know, if I have questions, I'll, I'll dial you up. But, uh, but I think that'll be OK. Is there a way to write it by hand and then like upload a picture instead of trying to type it? Yeah, I would have to, yeah, I mean, I have to change the response type to upload um, image. So uh, let's see. Do you want it to maybe like download the PDF and then email it to you or something? Or like draw on it? Um, well, I guess we could try it. So how about this? I'll take the two hardest ones and I'll change them to upload. Image. And then we'll just see what the results look like. Just so we can try a little bit of both. Wait. OK, OK, never mind. Sorry. No, that's OK. I mean, it, we're trying to figure stuff out here. So uh, let's see. So I'm just going to edit things really quickly and see if I can change the response type to um, image upload. But I don't know if this is going to be a, um, a problem for folks. So uh, anyway, let's change it essay to file upload question. Yeah, so I'll take the two hardest ones and I'll change them to file upload. And then after we go through this process, then you can decide which way you want to do it. Okay, so problems five and six are file upload. So I think I've taken care of that. Okay. So I'm just going to edit one more time. Okay, so there's one big problem for us left to do. And uh, let's see how that goes. All right, sorry for the delay. I just want to check one more thing. Okay, let's get it. All right, so I'd like to uh, tackle uh, problem 12. And it's a doozy. So, but again, if you can handle problem 12, then uh, you're really in a good place. All right, so I'm going to change my viewpoint and we'll take a look at problem 12. And it's super dense. So it's talking about a complete cycle. And I uploaded uh, a PDF that um, has a chart that goes along with this problem. Uh, a big chart, and then uh, you could uh, 
Uh, you could use that chart if you want to, or you can just make your, your own chart on a piece of paper. But, but this is really a good thing for us to do. So let's, uh, I'm gonna recreate the PDF. And uh, I think what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna share my, um, yeah, actually, I'm just gonna share my screen to do this one. So then I can fill in the PDF. So I'm not gonna do this on the whiteboard. I'm going to uh, just kind of narrate how we're doing it. And this is a big one too. So please make sure you use the chat or, um, you know, just bust in there and, uh, and interrupt me. <laughs> I'm doing something. And, can we go like aggressive on the dissection of like the problem, like word wise into like how we enter into the math part? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel like that's what I struggle with the most. Yeah, for sure. Everybody struggles with that. Okay, good. So uh, share your screen again. And please uh, jump right in there with questions. Don't be shy. Okay, great. So we start off with this diagram. And we have a couple of ways to get from A to C. So one of them is a curved path. And then uh, the other one is a rectangular path. So two different processes. And, and A is, to C is kind of a mixture. We don't really know if it's adiabatic or isothermal. Or what? We don't really have enough information to tell. But we do know that the path on along ABC, the work done, is negative 48. Now, that makes sense. So that's the path A to B to C. Because we have a compression. So from A to B, the bond gets smaller. So that explains the negative sign. And then here, the work done is zero. Right, so let's type in some of the things that um, that we know to be two. So we're talking about A to B to C. So I'm going to work down here. So it says uh, when we're going from A to C along the curved path, the work done by the gas is negative 35 joules. Now it's negative again because when we're going on the curved path, the volume is getting smaller. So that that makes sense. So I'm going to type in negative 35 here. And the heat added to the gas is negative 63. Well, that really means heat was removed from the gas, right? So we can go negative 63. How are we doing so far? I don't hear a lot of groans. So. <laughs> All right, so now uh, go ahead and do the math for this next one because It's just, uh, it's just the first law. But watch out for the minus signs. So this is Q minus W. So this is Q, negative 63. And W is also negative, but we're subtracting it. So remember, subtracting a negative number is the same thing as adding it. Just have to do a little lighting change there. You know, when I'm doing this, I'm extremely literal. I type in negative 63 minus negative 35, just so I make sure I don't make a mistake. And I get this. How are we doing? Okay, good. Now let's move on. So that we took care of the first clue. Now along the path A, B, C, so that's horizontal line and then a vertical line. And then 
uh, it says along that path, the work done is negative 48. So I'm going to come down in here and I put negative 48. But along the path B to C, that's a vertical line. So there's no area under the curve. So that's going to be zero. And therefore, this is negative 48. Because when I add the work done on A to B and the work done from B to C, I should get the total work done going from A to B to C. Remember, the work done is the area under the curve. So it makes sense that this is a smaller number. The curve path work is a smaller number than the uh, rectangular path, because there's less area under the curve. All right, so we're getting there. Uh, and now it says, what is Q for the path A to B to C? But it doesn't say anything about that. But one thing I do know is that since both this path, the curved one, and this path, the rectangle one, because they both take us from A to C, then that means the total change in energy also has to be the same. Since the endpoints are the same, then the change in internal energy is the same. So I'm just going to make some uh, additions here. We're supposed to find Q, right? So Q is actually equal to, if I re reverse engineer this, that's going to be uh, delta U plus W. I'm going to put this over here. So we could, we could totally just write this in here and uh, let's do a little bit of editing here. So if I just throw the W onto the other side of the equation, then it's delta U plus work done. Right, so that now tells me a formula. And again, I'm just going to type it in exactly the way it is. Negative 48 plus negative 28. And so that means that the work done is going to be negative 76. Or I mean, the heat is negative 76, which means heat's extracted, of course. But How's it going? All right, now, so we, we took care of part C, we've got that. Um, we have, sorry, we have part A done, A, B, C. Now, here's the tricky one. So the pressure at point C is half of what it was up here. I don't know what the change in volume is, but I do know that the change in volume is the same for both. But the air is going in the other way. So where this work done was negative, this one is going to be positive. And work done is pressure times change in volume. So the change in volume is the same for both, but this pressure is half of what the other one is. So that means that the word tier is going to be positive 24. The work is done at half the pressure with the same change in volume. So that means that the work done is half. And that's it. Pausing, waiting for explosion of protests. Can you why it's positive again? Yeah, the arrow's going the other way. So this is an expansion and not a compression. So the delta V is positive. Okay. Yeah. That's a big one. That's a big idea. Now, D to A, the work done is equal to zero. This is vertical. And that means the total work done is plus 24. And if you notice, we wind up back at A. So if the change in internal energy going from A to C is negative 28, then the change in internal energy going from C to A is positive 28. And now I can calculate the heat because I'm just going to add those two together. So let's just put uh, 24 plus 28. So you know what would be a great exercise for you to, to try is that if you print off the PDF for this blank um, paper and then see if you can reproduce how we did this, that, that would really help in your understanding. 
Okay, so now I've got the answer to part C. Now, what is the change in internal energy going from DC? That's, that's really annoying. So the way that's written, the way I interpret that question is that the D is where you end up and the C is where you started. That's the way I interpret that. And it's telling us that that's equal to five. So when we go from C to D, they're telling us that the change in internal energy is five. So I'm just gonna go with that and I'm, I'm gonna go with a positive five. And now, of course, uh, this is a number I don't know. And of course I can fill in these two as well. That's what makes it sort of like Sudoku, right? So don't wait for me. Plus five plus this number has to be 28. Plus 24 plus five has to equal this Q. And this Q plus this Q has to be 52, right? So let's just take it step by step again. Q is delta U plus W. So 24 plus five is positive 29. And this plus this has to be 52, right? So I need a number. So when I add it to 29, I, I get 52. It's code for 52 minus 29 and I get 23. And delta U is Q minus W, but W is zero. So this should be plus 23. And then of course, these all add up. That's correct too. So that, that's what I was referring to Sudoku. So everything adds up in all the ways it's supposed to. And are we done? Did we answer everything? Do I have Q for the path D to A? Yes, I do. It's right there. And so once again, some of the numbers were stated explicitly had explicit terms and some are implied. Whew. That's it. So like I said, a good plan for this would be for you to uh, try and print a blank of this form and see if you can go back and repeat this on your own. Uh, we don't have entries for these two, but we weren't asked any questions about them either. So I'm going to stop sharing and then just check in with you really quick and see how we're doing. Like I said, the UVM students are jumping out the windows right now. But some simple tools about understanding the rules of the game and then how they, how they add up is going to be really useful for you. Some of you look skeptical. <laughs> That's okay. Just try a little bit. All right, so that's pretty much what I had for you tonight. You've got that quiz piece. I'm gonna leave this up for a little while just so you can get in there and sort of uh, ask questions. I don't know, do you, want, do you wanna try and do breakout rooms for this? To, to talk about it? Give me a, a thumbs up like that if you think that's a good idea? That's under reactions down on the bottom. Or do you just want to try and go it alone? Okay, so I set the due date. Seems like there's consensus around that. Uh, I set the due date for Friday at midnight because, you know, most of you are going to want to on Friday night do physics stuff. But I wanted to make it due uh, a day after our next class so that we can, you can ask questions about it, okay? So I'm not trying to terrorize you or anything, but uh, you know, I do want to give you an opportunity to show what you know. Um, but I also, you know, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. So you can ask questions. I'm going to do another Thursday, another session like this on Thursday. For those of you uh, who came in late, um, I was talking about how my supervisor reached out to me uh, this afternoon and uh, 
I have a new supervisor, so that was kind of a surprise. And then uh, also kind of told me I was doing everything wrong. Not really, but that's what it felt like. And, uh, but said that we can't require Zoom meeting attendance for a hybrid class. So you don't have to attend Thursday. You don't have to attend any Tuesday meetings anymore. Our first uh, hybrid session in the lab is going to be uh, a week from tonight uh, on the ground floor of, of uh, CCV Winooski. And that's the uh, only class that's happening on the ground floor as, as far as I know. And we're gonna have lots of people there to help direct you. So that's the plan. If you have any more questions about that, we can talk about it on Thursday. So, any other questions? Okay, I will linger until everybody's gone. But if you do want to ask a separate question, feel free to, to do so. So I do think I have a bit of a question about um, U versus Q. Yes. Because um, I'm used to dealing with Q in, in chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't see any U's chemistry. Yes. No U's. So it's throwing me for a bit of a loop because U is doing what I was used to Q doing uh, in some ways. So it's internal energy of a system? Right. So Q is sort of like a relative term. And the, um, so it means a, a change, because we're talking about heat, and we're talk, specifically talking about how phase changes and temperature changes are caused or create flow of heat. So if you have an overall system, then that means that the internal energy is going to change by that amount because of heat. So for the problems on this quiz, you don't have to worry about the U part. Because really all the Qs would result in a change in internal energy. But since the heat flow is relative, then we, we've kind of addressed what the total internal energy is by identifying the mass and the heat capacity uh, and in whatever the initial temperature is. So that's kind of, you know, what the internal energy is. But specifically, uh, I was, um, I don't know if this helps or not, but I was trying to uh, remind folks that, again, that story about the dropping, a, just a drop of boiling water in the back of your hand compared to splashing it with a whole cup of boiling water. And so that the cup of water has much more internal energy than the single drop, even though they're at the same temperature. But for the purposes of MC delta T or ML, uh, the Q is really just a change in internal energy and you don't really have to do anything with the U body. Mm, I'm, I meant for a uh, problem number 12 that we just did. The yeah, thing. So for problem 12. So here's the, the, the big idea then is that um, the change in internal energy during the course of a complete cycle is zero, but we can do certain things. In fact, when I, I go, when I do this on Thursday, um, I'll show you what a PV diagram looks like for an internal combustion engine, right? So the, the basic idea is by taking a gas through different processes, we can actually get work done. So the one that I showed you just now, um, if you follow through that complete cycle, the total work done for the whole process 
uh, is a negative number. So in that case, we're putting energy, we're doing physical work on the gas. And if you look at the Q, the net Q value for everything is actually, uh, let's see, is actually positive, right? So we're doing work and we're getting heat out. So that's an example of a heat engine. Even though the total internal energy returns back to its original place, we were able to take physical work and turn it into heat. So if you think about uh, an internal combustion engine, that does the reverse process. It takes heat and turns it into physical work. I think this is because I'm used to thinking of it that way. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so the steam engine is a classic, and I think we'll probably lead off with that on Thursday is just to take a look at some of those cycles. But the, since if you set up a, a situation where there's heat flow, you can use that heat flow and channel that heat flow into something that does physical work. So you're literally harvesting heat and turning it into another form of energy. And again, that's why I said for the last thousand years, we've gotten all our energy by burning stuff. Mm -hmm. Not a great plan. Can you explain to me, I, I think I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around this part, um, but from A to B to C, the Q was negative 76, but from C to D to A, it's positive 52. I feel like in my head, I would assume that it'd be it would be like positive 76. It would be equal to what the heat was in the other direction. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh, you and James are both kind of asking questions that are in the same ballpark. And I'm really glad that you're thinking about it because this is really, this is why this is important. It's called a heat engine. And usually we associate engines with having some kind of doing, you know, doing something for us. So, uh, so this process, if you notice that, let's just do the totals, right? So if you add the work done from A to B to C, and then add that to C to D to A, it's not zero, right? So it's a negative number. So it's what, negative 11, right? And then, surprise, surprise, now look at the Qs. Look at the Q for A to B to C, that's negative 76. And then the Q from, I don't know, that didn't exactly work out. Uh, oh, I know why. Okay, we should be comparing apples to apples. So, if you take the work done from A to B to C, that's negative 48, and the work done from C to D to A, that's 24. So the overall work done was negative 24. And then if you add the heat from A to B to C, that's negative 76, and you add that to C to D to A, which is 52, you again get negative 24. So what's the, the bottom line about that? Well, uh, what that means is that we were actually able to uh, do work on the gas and um, and drive heat out. That's essentially what that's saying. So during these processes that go in cycles with a heat engine, that's the dynamic is there's an exchange between work and heat. We're either able to turn heat into work or turn work into heat.
Would you ever have a time where, so both of these were negative 24, but would you ever have, so you start yeah. at a point and then end at the same point through different routes where the Q and the double W wouldn't be the same? So the reason why they're the same is because it's a complete cycle. We wind mm -hmm. up in the same part. Okay, so they would always be the same then. That's right, for a complete okay. time. Good question.